Qing is probably the most powerful economic nation in the game. This is purely because of a combination of huge resource stores and population. Playing Qing, if you do it right, is guaranteed success and an instant path number one great power. All they do require some smart plays in the opening of the game. We're gonna go over that stuff, but this video isn't really a guide to playing Qing. See, Qing is really easy to play and requires no particular tactics to play outside of the very first opening moves. What we're gonna be looking at today is Qing's opportunity as an educational nation. Today we're gonna to learn how to build up an economy effectively and how to reach literal billions of GDP without any war or colonization so that we can isolate this particular skill. Victoria 3 is composed of many moving parts, but in order to learn how they work in clockwork, we first have to study the anatomy of each gear. Today we're going to make Qing into a perfect autarky, and hit as high of a GDP as possible without warfare or colonization. I'm going to go into detail on my exact rationales behind what to build, when to build, where to build, and how to make economic decisions. Normally, I wouldn't play as a nation with such a singular focus, but I know many people have trouble with understanding how to construct an economy, and the easiest way to teach it is to take you through an autarky as a nation with the people and resources to do it. Let's do this. First off, I'll show you how to start strong as Qing. You're going to want to max out taxes and take as many consumption taxes as possible since you want to build lots of construction sectors and expand the economy. You're also going to want to throw the literati into government and start abolishing serfdom. Even though the chance is super low, we're just hoping it'll pass with some luck so we can always get events that increase the chance. When the event about the opium wars comes up, pick the we have to do something option and immediately ban opium. If you're lucky like me, you'll pass abolition of serfdom and if you're only a bit lucky, you'll gain some success chance. If you're not lucky, you'll go to 0% chance to pass the law, in which case, switch over to trying to pass isolationism. You'll have to swap the literati out for the rural folk for isolationism. We're doing this to ensure that no one can steal our goods, and it'll give us some nice authority we can use for decrees and consumption taxes. Since we banned opium, Britain is almost certainly going to declare war on us. This is actually how we're going to get recognition. When Britain declares a diplomatic incident, add in recognition and war reparations. We can perhaps get both, but we only need recognition so it's okay if you don't get the reparations. The moment the war is declared, go naval invade Gambia. There will be no navies in the way, and no garrisons of Gambia to stop you. Remember that with recognition and war reparations, occupation of any kind will count towards the war goal, so you'll immediately be draining British war support. Next what will happen is Britain will invade Beijing. You can't stop them, they will wreck you, but all you have to do is survive long enough for their exhaustion to drain from Gambia's occupation until you can get recognition. I recommend stacking up your entire army on the Beijing front in defense mode and just hoping to slow them down so they can't capitulate you. In the meantime, you may have passed isolationism. If you failed to pass abolition of serfdom before, try that again now. If you've got both passed, then you have no more laws you need to pass, although I like to get professional army since I just prefer that law, but you don't need it. You'll want to eventually switch to agrarianism or interventionism as opportunities to do so pop up. It's completely fine to go agrarian first and then go interventionist later. You also may have built up a bunch of construction sectors. You can start building up some agriculture now, since agriculture is a highly profitable and job creating sector. I'll go into detail on that later, once we're into the economic meat of the game. Anyway, in my case, the war against Britain went great. Despite them occupying Beijing, my occupation of Gambia made them capitulate before I could, and therefore I got both reparations and recognition from Britain. With that, you're now the number 3 great power, with serfdom abolished and a perfectly isolationist economy. Obviously, with all this population and all these natural resources, you're pretty much guaranteed to rise to the top even without a solid understanding of how to construct an economy. But we're going to explore how an isolationist economy works and see what lessons we can learn which will apply to all economic models in the game. Let's work from the bottom up. Every building in the game takes in some kind of input in the form of input goods and wages to produce some kind of output. Generally speaking, the goal of any building is to produce an output which is worth more than the cost of its input goods and its wages. Buildings operate in a market, which determines the prices for their input and output goods, and they operate in a state, which determines the wage for its workers. First, let's talk about markets. In Victoria 3, market prices are determined by the balance between buy orders and sell orders of any particular good. Sell orders are the amount of something available, and buy orders the amount of something which is needed, supply and demand respectively. When supply and demand are exactly equal, the price is the base number for the good. Prices can range from negative 75% to plus 75% of that base number. 
If the goods are so imbalanced that the price would be higher than 175% of its base price, it will create a shortage. Businesses that use goods which are in shortage will have significantly lower outputs and probably will fail. This is the core gameplay, balancing market prices such that they favor your interests. It's not always in your interest that prices be balanced, nor that they be low nor high. We'll talk about when you'd want prices to be in certain places later. These market prices intrinsically control the profitability of any given building. Profitability determines whether or not a building will continue to operate. So long as the owners of a building see profits, they will hire more workers and buy input goods from other businesses to create their output goods. The purchase of input goods creates a supply chain, and this is the extremely important thing to understand when making a building. Nothing is made in isolation. Some supply chains are extremely complex, others are very simple. Let's start with a simple one, and then have a peek at a complex one. For a simple supply chain, we can take a look at groceries on their most basic production method. Food industries take grain and turn it into groceries. Grain comes from farms, which have no input good. Groceries are sold to pops to be consumed. This is an extremely simple and one-way supply chain. Grain is produced with wages and is sold to food industries who produce groceries for pop consumption. This means that farms create sell orders for grain, while food industries create buy orders for grain. If these orders are balanced, grain will cost its base price. If they're imbalanced, the price will alter to fit that disparity. How about a slightly more complex supply chain? Let's have a look at one of my favorites for the early game, the livestock grain supply chain. This supply chain is special in that it's almost perfectly cyclical. We can use the intensive agriculture tech to put on a production method for wheat that makes it use fertilizer as an input good. And we can make our livestock consume grain to produce fertilizer. The wheat farm will purchase fertilizer to produce grain, which is then bought by the livestock ranches. These livestock ranches consume that grain to produce fertilizer, fabric, and meat. Fabric can be used for all sorts of things, and meat is consumed by pops, while that fertilizer is then sold back to the wheat farms who can produce even more grain because of the fertilizer. This supply chain gets weird because of its cyclical nature, but it ultimately is quite simple. It's a grain and fertilizer loop that has some extra products. Critically, this loop produces excess grain, since the grain produced by the farm per fertilizer is higher than the grain consumed per fertilizer produced by the livestock. This means we get enough excess grain for usage in other industries, making the supply chain really strong. Hopefully these handmade diagrams are helping you understand. If this looks complex to you, I'm truly sorry because I have some bad news. Uh, it only gets more complex from here. Let's take a look at the supply chain for power plants. We're going to use the production method you'd reasonably expect to see when having just discovered power plants. So this isn't even the most complex it can get. Power plants buy motors to produce electricity. Motor industries buy steel to produce motors. Steel mills buy iron and coal to produce steel. Iron mines buy tools and coal to produce iron. Coal mines buy tools to produce coal. Tool workshops buy wood and steel to produce tools. Lumber mills buy tools and electricity to produce wood. This chain is mostly cyclical, but the electricity that goes into the whole supply chain is way lower than the amount produced, so you end up with lots of spare electricity. Okay, so this diagram probably looks a little bit complicated, and you may be wondering how the hell you're going to remember it. The answer is to play the game for a few hundred hours, and suddenly these supply chains will simply be instinctual. Trust me when I say that I do not constantly think about supply chains at this level of complexity, but at the end of the day, my gamer instincts come from these principles. Remember as well that most supply chains build off of other ones. It's not like every good you produce is going to have to create an entirely new chain. Some supply chains just piggyback off of other ones. The skill of Victoria 3's gameplay is knowing which supply chains will aid you, and what goods are needed for those supply chains. At the end of the day, every supply chain begins with some sort of raw material or agriculture, which are both limited resources. As I apply this lesson about supply chains to the autarky of China I'm making here, I'll explain which supply chains I'm constructing so you can keep them in mind as we go. Back to the game. One of the first supply chains any player will construct, no matter what nation they're playing, will be the mines and tools supply chain. This one is nice and simple. We need wood for construction in the early game. Wood can be harvested using no input goods, but it's perfectly inefficient, so we're going to change production methods to the ones that use tools. That means we need tools now. Tools at their most basic are made with just wood, but we're going to want to make them out of iron and then eventually steel using the best production method it has to offer. For that reason, I'm going to start building iron mines and tool workshops, which will feed each other. Iron mines will use tools to produce iron, and that iron will be reinvested back into the tool workshops to make tools for our other supply chains. Since one of our biggest expenses is inevitably going to be construction goods, this means prioritizing a wood supply chain early is extremely important. It's also the case that wood is the basis for other supply chains like paper. We'll eventually be phasing out most wood from our supply chains, since surprisingly wood is one of the most limited resources of the entire game. 
staying on wood-based production methods will eventually become completely unsustainable. The next supply chain we'll want to create is the example one I mentioned earlier with grain and fertilizer. We don't quite have intensive agriculture yet, so we can't do the supply chain properly right now, but we can still preemptively build up rice and livestock since they have no input goods and are useful right off the bat. Remember that livestock produces fabric, which we can use for our early game construction goods and for textiles later on once we start working on our consumer economy. For now, lots of rice and lots of livestock will inflate our GDP, which increases minting for our budget. Those are the first two supply chains to make that I generally go for in any game, so long as I have access to those raw materials. It's a different story for small nations without such luxuries. The next things I built were government bureaucracy for some tax capacity, and universities everywhere for qualifications and innovations. I usually put one university in every state since it's important to keep up on qualifications across the country. This actually leads into another early game supply chain, which is paper. Luckily, paper is as simple as wood into paper, and acts as an extension on the already constructed supply chain from before. Later on, we'll be adding sulfur and dyes to that supply chain. But we don't have the tech for that right now. Because paper is consumed as a government good, the expenses on paper take directly from our government budget. That means it's pretty important to keep paper cheap lest you face bankruptcy. I would say in general that these three supply chains form the most important all-around useful chains. Different nations will have different needs. For example, Prussia is going to need a much larger munitions and arms industry supply chain, but as Qing we don't need one at all. Because grain is so important to pop consumption and later on to food industries, getting lots of grain early is important. Because tools are the basis for so many supply chains, getting them up and running is huge. Finally, paper is one of the most expensive government goods, so having lots of paper will be good for all nations. To be clear, for simplicity, I'm not doing any trading in this run, but you can replace any given step in a supply chain with a trade route. If you make lots of grain, but you don't have the pops to consume it, you can replace the buy orders for grain with trading. Let's not talk about trade though, since I already covered it in my video on trade that I did as America. Anyway, with all that done, we've averted the opium crisis. We're the number two great power, and we're poised to build up a perfect autarky. Let's talk about how money is split between capitalists, the workers, and government. It's not often obvious how buildings actually translate into money for the budget, which is the metric most people want to see growing as they play. To be clear, the government budget growing is not always a metric of success, but for simplicity, we'll focus on how money goes from businesses into the hands of the government. There are a couple different taxation types which any given nation will have. Assuming you have per capita taxation, which is the one most people will have until they eventually unlock the late game tax methods, then you'll be charging an income tax, a poll tax, and various consumption taxes. An income tax, a thing you're likely quite familiar with. A portion of all wages which are taken by a pop we put into the government treasury. Keep in mind that dividends earned from profits on buildings are not income. Poll taxes are essentially a tax on existence, which is flatly paid across all people. Consumption taxes are paid by pops from goods that you spend authority to mark as luxury goods. Most early game economies rely on consumption taxes almost entirely. Unfortunately, Victoria 3 likes to be weird about its terminology, so this can be confusing. The taxation laws mention something called a land tax. You'll notice that this land tax is mysteriously not in your budget overview. That's because land tax is actually called poll tax in the overview. Land taxes, for whatever reason, are treated as a separate from poll tax in the tooltips, but are actually the exact same thing. Okay, so those are the main revenue sources for a nation's budget. First off, poll taxes are flat. This means that they can only be increased by simply having more people to tax or raising your tax rates. That means they kind of suck heading into the early mid game and in particular heading into the late game. Income taxes are based on how much money our pops make from wages. This means if our pops make more money, we make more money. We'll talk about how wages are calculated in a second. Finally, there are consumption taxes, which let us make money from our pops consuming particular goods. It's important to note that businesses don't pay consumption taxes. This means that when your livestock ranches buy grain from wheat farms for their cattle, they don't pay a tax for that if you have a consumption tax on grain. Only goods bought by pops for individual consumption are taxed. This leads us with two tax types that we can reasonably expect to exploit for government funding, income and consumption. Let's first talk about income. A pop is paid a wage from their job based on either the minimum wage of that state or based on ever rising competitive wages if businesses are competing for workers. Wage competition is pretty complicated and given that we're playing in China, it's not really a factor. There are literally millions of pops per state which means labor is not in shortage at all. It's a buyer's market out here. Let's focus in on how wages are calculated. It's actually really simple. Check a state's average standard of living. That number is what determines minimum wage. Minimum wage is then multiplied by a number based on the job a pop occupies. 
For example, an engineer makes triple minimum wage, while a machinist makes only one and a half times minimum wage. If we click on a pop and check their expenses, we can see a percentage of that wage is calculated as income tax. That income tax goes directly into our treasury every week. What this means for you is that increasing standard of living across any given state will increase the income taxes you receive because each pop will make a larger wage. Larger wages mean more income tax. There's a double whammy with this though because richer pops also consume more goods. If you charge consumption taxes on a particular good, as pops get richer, they'll consume more goods in general, including potentially those goods on which you have a tax. This acts as the governmental justification for raising standard of living. Beyond caring for your people, or some garbage sentimental reason like that, the government makes more money when people are richer. If you look at any given business until you get access to the final two tax systems, the profit number of a business is paid out only to capitalists. This number is not considered income. If we look at a capitalist's income, we can see their dividend income and their wage income. While we do tax the wage they make, we do not tax that dividend income. For now, that means profits are meaningless for increasing government revenue, except insofar as dividends make capitalists rich, which makes them consume goods that we may be taxing. A common misconception I see amongst players is thinking, oh my god, this business makes 200,000 pounds per week, this is a good thing. But in reality, profits do not benefit your government as much as higher standards of living do. So that's how money is divided amongst the capitalists, the pops, and the government. For the early and mid-game, it's all about getting income taxes because they're the most reliable way to make money, but eventually we'll want to switch over to making money off of dividend taxes. The best way to increase standard of living is to make buildings which employ a high proportion of engineers and machinists over laborers, or other highly paid jobs, and also keeping commonly consumed goods cheap. You can mouse over your standard of living number and then go through way too many tooltips to see what sorts of goods are the most consumed by your pops. Keep the ones at the top nice and cheap, and the people will gain standard of living, therefore increasing minimum wages across the country, and therefore increasing the income tax that you make. So now that we know how to make money for the government, let's talk about how to effectively use that money. I used to play a lot of StarCraft when I was younger. If you've ever played an RTS, what I'm about to explain will make a lot of sense. It's never useful to bank your money. Money which gets put into gold reserves is money that isn't being used to improve your nation. The only reason to build up a gold reserve is if you have reason to believe that in the future your income will decline. The best example would be if you're expecting to go to war and you know that your balance will be negative during that war. The purpose of this video, again, will be completely isolating the lessons just the economy, so as a principle for economics, Gold reserves are bad. This means that so long as income is positive, you want to be finding new ways to spend your money. This could be on expanding the military, on making universities, or building a government bureaucracy to spend on institutions. It could also mean subsidizing certain industries which need a leg up due to lack of profitability, but which form an important part of the supply chain. It could mean bankrolling another nation to make them more friendly, or it could mean expanding the construction sector. It could even mean dropping taxes so that people can get higher standards of living. Sometimes lowering taxes will actually result in a higher income than higher taxes since people will start becoming richer, thus increasing minimum wages, and therefore increasing income taxes. Generally speaking, the best way to spend government money though is on the construction sector. The more construction you have, the more you can continue to expand the economy. Keep in mind that construction sectors do adjust the prices of goods that are used for constructing. So when you spam construction sectors, you will simultaneously consume more of those goods and make them more expensive. Do not be afraid to destroy construction sectors if you realize you got overzealous and can't afford the costs. As well, switching to better building methods is a huge boost to your ability to build, and to your supply chains, because generally speaking, the later game building methods use materials which are not raw materials. You don't want to waste raw materials because they are the least plentiful of any good. Wooden buildings consume precious trees when iron buildings consume iron and tools, while still using wooden fabric but less of it, which is far more plentiful. Then, after that, steel buildings consume steel. You don't want to waste raw materials because they are the least plentiful of any good. Wooden buildings consume precious trees, while iron buildings consume tools and iron which are far more plentiful, while still only using a little bit of wooden fabric. Then, after that, steel buildings consume steel, glass, explosives, and tools, which aren't raw materials at all. That being said, upgrading your construction methods is super expensive unless you're prepared for it. You'll want to pre-build industries for your construction zones before switching over, and then do it once you have lots of those goods. I actually made the mistake of switching to iron buildings too early in my own run, and did in fact swallow my pride and switch back to wooden buildings once I started to rack up some credit. The other major thing to spend money on is subsidies. 
It can be extremely difficult to determine when subsidies are worth it, and often you're best off not messing with subsidies. If you don't know what you're doing, I don't have any catch-all scenarios where subsidies are always good, except for railroads. Railroads should always be subsidized because without infrastructure your entire country will fall apart. Beyond that, subsidies should be experimented with in any given economy. Try subsidizing something, and see if the effect it has on your supply chain results in a higher standard of living, or perhaps it makes certain government goods cheaper which saves you money. The other reason to subsidize is for normal wages. I talked a little bit about normal wages in my America video, but I'm going to discuss it again here since it's relevant. You may have noticed that sometimes when you subsidize a building, it'll take money from your treasury even if it's a profitable business. This is because of how normal wages work. This little known mechanic is sort of like a national minimum wage. If each individual state has a minimum wage, the average minimum wage across all incorporated states makes the normal wage. This wage determines the amount of money you pay government workers and also determines what wage workers in subsidized industries get paid regardless of the profits of a business. If you mouse over the wages section of the expenses breakdown in a business, you can see the increase to wages being paid for by your subsidies. This can be really useful for pumping up the standards of living in a particular area if you want to accelerate its growth. Consider that POPs in general will trend towards higher standards of living as goods get cheaper. But if, for whatever reason, you're having trouble doing that, you can just pump money into their pockets to at least get them to the national average. Unfortunately, you can't subsidize your way into making a POP go beyond the average, but being able to play catch up with government funds can be wise. The final way to spend government money is on bureaucracy. For China, this is really important because their tax capacity is super low across most of the nation, so bureaucracy tends to pay for itself through the tax capacity it generates. In other nations, it won't pay for itself, so you have to think of whether or not the benefits of an institution are worth the government wages and goods they consume. Usually, they are worth it, but it always depends on the context. When you see someone on YouTube with some thumbnail like 5 million pounds balance, OMG, so good economy, don't be fooled. Those players who build up huge balances and gold reserves are actually hampering their nation by taking in taxes that are not reinvested into the economy or the people. The reason why many people won't end up reaching the upper echelons of GDP and standard of living is because they hoard too much government money. In theory, the only thing limiting your growth should be population and raw materials, not gold reserves. Okay, so that's government spending. Let's look at a couple more supply chains and then talk about factors external to the economy that can affect growth. Like I mentioned before, supply chains are somewhat modular in that any given step often has surplus goods which can act as attachment points for new sub-supply chains. I'm making this sound more complex than what it is, but essentially every supply chain tends to produce some kind of excess good which can be used for something else. For example, in the mine supply chain, we produce some steel to make tools, but we don't use all that steel for just tools. We can tack on a motor industry chain to that steel output and then tack on railways to that motor industry. Later on, we can even use those motors to reinvest into our mines with steam donkeys. This means it's best not to think of every supply chain as its own independent entity, but more as a piece of a wider chain. In the early game, there are lots of isolated supply chains. In the mid and late game, there are none. When you construct a building, try to have an idea of where that building is in the supply chain, and how that'll rock the balance of things. You can in theory just do the math by checking the individual numbers in your market, but I'll be honest, the numbers kinda just make my eyes glaze over. I prefer to think of each supply chain like a little bubble that inflates within a limited space. The limited space is a representation of your resources and population. You can never grow beyond your limited space without obtaining more space from someone else. When you increase the size of a particular sector of the supply chain, its bubble inflates. If there's space, that's all that happens. If there's not, then something else must shrink for it to fit. At the same time, most bubbles, without the support of other bubbles, will also collapse. So that means you've got to keep an eye on how big each bubble gets and ensure that each one has the support that it needs. For the purpose of this video, I won't be doing any expansion or puppeting or anything besides annexing Korea and Tibet since they're already my subjects. Most nations will quickly run out of raw materials, though without colonization or war. China is think of an exception, although they will still run out eventually too. In terms of which buildings are good to build, the general priority for what to build is based on what's short in your market and how important it is. For example, let's say I have a shortage of fish. This could be a problem, but fish are only consumed by a small portion of our pop, so it doesn't really matter. I could use fish for our food industries, and I am using it, but my food industries are still profitable even with expensive fish, so it's nothing to worry about. Fish is a relatively weak impact on my market, both for the pops and for industries. How about something like clothes? Although we don't use clothes in our industries, our pops consume them, and as I mentioned earlier, having higher standards of living is good all around for everyone, so we want to get a huge textiles industry going. This is probably what I'd recommend almost always prioritizing, getting a strong consumer economy going. Consumer economies are composed of goods which pops use, not businesses. 
When pops consume goods, it's essentially the final loop back around of a supply chain. Pops consume goods so that they can live and work for businesses. All supply chains inevitably lead to either pop consumption, trade routes, or government consumption, with pop consumption being the vast majority of where most supply chains end. From there, it's more or less just about determining based on the context of your own game which consumer goods need attention. I'm not going to be able to guide you through everything since there are simply are too many variables to measure. I will say, textiles are overpowered. Extremely overpowered. Textiles have almost no limit on their input goods because silk, fabric, electricity, and tools are so easy to come by. In general, the deeper a raw material is buried in a supply chain, the less of it is needed to support that supply chain. Consider that tools require wood. In a level 1 tool workshop using steel tool production methods, we consume 30 wood to make 80 tools. That's a ratio of 3 wood to 8 tools. Kind of an annoying ratio to manage, but whatever. Meanwhile, a textile mill with electric sewing machines and automatic power looms produces 140 clothes per 15 tools. That's 28 clothes to 5 tools. Given that tool workshops can output 8 tools for 3 wood, we can do some math that come out to 4.8 wood per 28 clothes. We can compare this to furniture, which directly use 1 wood to make 3 furniture. If you multiply that by 4.8 to get a comparable ratio, we get 14.4 furniture per 4.8 wood. See how clothes are almost twice as efficient when it comes to wood consumption in total? I am ignoring some of the wood consumption from all the other tools being used throughout the supply chain, but given how negligible the amount of wood consumed by the other parts of the chain are, I figure that clothes still end up significantly on top. In general, you'll want to find these sorts of industries which rely on either manufactured goods themselves, or which use more agricultural goods. In China, there are thousands of rice farms and other agriculture to build, but there's only so much wood. I like food industries, although the canneries consume an even more limited resource, fish. I think textiles are the best industry in the game, and along the way, the businesses needed for the actual supply chain are all necessary and also good because of that. Furniture unfortunately really sucks, and will consume almost all of your wood for a measly consumer good. You do need some furniture to fulfill your pop's needs, but beyond that, mass production of furniture isn't all that effective. Let's go take a look at how China is doing given my economic focused playstyle. You'll notice that I haven't done any expansion, again aside from Korea and Tibet. I've hit 4 billion GDP, although the number fluctuates based on whether or not I'm building something. Building increases the price of construction goods, which means my GDP inflates and deflates as I choose to use my over 8,000 construction points. Standard of living is at 19.1, which isn't super impressive, but given the half billion population, I think it's not bad. The higher your population is, the harder it is to give everyone a job, so as China, getting a crazy high standard of living is far harder than as, say, America. Please check out my guide on trading, I'm begging you, I need this clout. Our army is relatively modern, although because I've gotten something of an inward perfection philosophy here, I haven't paid much attention to it. Also, since I was bored, I went and conquered a little piece of Africa, and I popped into Persia just to test out military a bit. Rest assured, I did this at the very end of the playthrough, and it had no effect on my market's ability to grow. Simply put, if I had been expanding and grabbing up colonies since the beginning of the game, I could have gone even further. Especially if I had been doing trade, I could have gone even crazier. But again, this run has a very particular goal, which is to teach you about economics. Although China's resource stores are immense, they do run out, and in particular, wood runs out. I can't emphasize enough how wood is genuinely the rarest and most valuable raw material. There are so many mines out there, and there's so much oil and rubber and so on, but wood? The largest store of wood in the game is in Russia. 34 logging camps right over there. Most iron and coal mines are larger than 34 and are placed across the world. Not gonna lie, Paradox, you might want to consider adding more wood to the game, or a fourth production method that makes us get more wood from logging camps. Maybe chainsaws should give more? Considering that you use oil for chainsaws, you think such a valuable resource would do more than just reduce the worker count for something as low value as wood. I say low value, but in this Victorian world, wood is everything. Why can't there be like a cache of 100 trees, similar to how mines go into the three digit counts at times? Do you have any idea how massive the forests of BC are? I would know, I live here, and I go on hikes every once in a while. Look at these things. Let me ruin BC's beauty and chop it all down. How does Alberta have the same number of logging camps as BC? Have you been to Alberta? I was born there. There's nothing there but snow, farms, and oil. Are you telling me Pennsylvania has the same amount of wood as BC? Forgive my rambling. I just can't take that in a game with stuff like oil, and coal, and sulfur, and so many other valuable materials. Wood is my limiting factor. I mean, check this out. I can't expand my economy anymore because I'm out of wood. Wood is becoming too expensive and I have no way to get any more supply of it besides conquering new land. To be fair, I'm also running out of coal and iron, but I'm much further away from running out of that in comparison to my wood, and I also consume way more iron and coal in a market. 
Economic Balance Rant aside, that's the video. This is Ching. Ching is really powerful. You should play them so you can practice building an economy in isolation. The skills you'll pick up as Ching will apply to all nations, although you'll have to learn other mechanics through experience, and perhaps other videos. In my opinion, no number of YouTube videos will ever make you as good as just playing the game, so if you want to get good, work towards playing the game more, in a variety of situations. If you play Ching while using all the mechanics of the game and not just living in isolation, you can absolutely dominate the game from early on. This doesn't take much to get to skirmish infantry. With that level of army, you can defeat most of the great powers, but you might want to get to trench infantry before confronting France or Prussia. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this guide on building up an economy and supply chains. I may continue this run, but I also am thinking of doing something of a comprehensive guide using all the aspects of the game to create the ultimate Chinese empire or something. We'll see what I end up feeling like doing. Catch you on the next video. Oh, one more thing. My goal for this year was to get to 5,000 subscribers, and I've knocked that goal out of the park, so I wanted to say a quick thank you to everyone. I like to think that you've all been subscribed for the quality of the content and not for pity, but I suppose that can only be known in each individual's mind. Also, check out the Patreon poll in the description to vote for what language you want me to learn next. You may have seen that one German video on my channel a little while ago, which some of you might have thought was quite the anomaly. That's something I do on this channel uh, with my Patreon. I do foreign language videos every three months where I pick a different language based on what you guys vote for and make a video about it. To vote is free, you just need an account, but if you subscribe to the Patreon, you can get access to my journals about my language learning. Thank you for your time.